Good morning. PT on ice, family, friends, students. It's Older Adult Wednesday. My name is Dustin Jones. Christina Private, if you're listening to this, we need to come up with a cooler name than Older Adult Wednesday. I feel like we can be a little more creative than that. We'll have to, to brainstorm a little bit. I'll just wait a few minutes, let people roll in here on this lovely Wednesday morning. Um, I'm excited for today. Uh, it's our uh, annual chili cook-off at, at the home health um, agency that I work for. So this is always an interesting day when you get, you know, dozens of people just miserably stuffed with chili and then you send them out to people's homes to do home health visits. And we all have, you know, gastrointestinal issues and our patients aren't always happy about that. But yeah, we have a good time. I think I saw Allie. Good morning. Still working with all these controls here, so we'll just wait a little bit more. Okay, let's let's get into this. So, once again, my name is Dustin Jones, home health PT, uh, faculty with the Institute of Clinical Excellence with the course Modern Management of the Older Adult. Uh, Christina Previtt, formerly Novak, and I have been getting on the mic every Wednesday. So last week she talked about uh, frailty, which is a very, very interesting uh, topic in the world of, of geriatrics. Um, they're trying to define it better and better um, and to be able to screen for it and how to reverse it. So, Christina, you know, I would listen to that episode if you, if you haven't listened to it yet because she d does a really great job of defining it and showing some of the different measures that, that we use to uh, determine if someone is considered frail or pre-frail. Um, but she mentioned it's a it's a clinical geriatric syndrome, but it basically, if you were to boil it down, it's a vulnerability to external stressors. Um, is is kind of a, a dumbed down way way to put it. It's not necessarily just physical. You know, you need to keep that in mind. But we often deal uh, with kind of the physical you know side of things. But in many situations, um, we can reverse it. You know, we can reverse frailty. And one of the best drugs that uh, does that is medicine or sorry, exercise. <laughs> um, not partic in particularly strength training is a really, really helpful thing that we can do. Um, as, as the weeks go on, we're going to dive into, you know, strength training, how to apply it in a very safe but effective way um, with older adults, how to, how to dose it, how to progress it, what types of exercises you want to do. We're going to dive into that more and more. But before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of that, I wanted to talk about um, what I perceive as a big issue when we are working with older adults and want them to lift heavy things or want them to do, you know, hard work. And that is, you know, therapeutic alliance. And the way I like to view, um, view this is getting the W, getting the early win so I can get that buy-in and get that therapeutic alliance with that patient so we can do things that they may not be comfortable, you know, doing or, or something that's very new to them um, from what they've done before in therapy. So I'm going to dive into kind of couple categories of you know what I'm thinking about when I'm trying to get that early W and working with my patients. Um, so the first one that, that I want to talk about is establishing credibility. So with, you know, I'm in home health, so I'm, I'm going to speak from my experience, but I think a lot of people could, uh, you know, echo what, what I'm, uh, what I've experienced in terms of um, somewhat of an age gap, you know, between some of our older patients. So, you know, I'm 31. A lot of you all listening may be in your 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and if you're working with someone in their, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, there, there's a bit of an age gap there. And sometimes it's an issue. A lot of times it's not really. Um, but if it is, I feel like we need to work hard to establish credibility um, and trust and therapeutic alliance with our patients. And, and so there's a few things that I think about. The first one is I, I feel like we should really work hard to grasp what this person has gone through. Um, if, if you're new in our field and have not been around the block and understand kind of the, the medical meat grinder healthcare system that we have right now, it's tough. I mean, a lot of these patients that are coming into our, our clinics or we're going into their homes, um, they've had countless doctor's visits, countless you know, bouts of PT, countless trips to the emergency department, um, that may or may not have been good experiences. A lot of times that their kind of norm or their standard is 
you know, so-and-so is going to come in. They may listen to me for three or four minutes. They're going to be typing on their computer, and then off I go to the pharmacy to get my prescription or, you know, what, whatever it may be. But typically it's not a very um, good experience, and they've been told some very um, negative things, what's wrong with them for, you know, decades and decades, and that has an impact on how they view themselves. And so I, I, we need to be aware of that. Um, but I think we can capitalize on that because if we come in and we are completely different from any other interaction they've had in the healthcare system, we can stand to gain from that. So I think this all starts with the first phone call. So in, in home health, I have the luxury of I'm typically the first point of contact um, with my patients. So I call them to say, hey, you know, can I come to your home to do you know, an evaluation? And I know Jerry Durham talks a lot about this, but that phone call is priceless. It, it's their first contact with the company, uh, first contact with me, and I can demonstrate that I care about them, that I want to hear their story, that I want to know what they, the problems that they have, um, that they're worried about, and how we can address them. So that first phone call, um, which I know a lot of you all don't have that opportunity, um, but I feel is, is super, super important to make that first impression to establish credibility. The second thing that I'll do, and, and this is unique to home health, but I take my shoes off when I get to the, the front door. Um, home health typically, uh, you know, doesn't have a good rap about going into people's homes that, you know, may be unclean uh, to say the least. But when you come into someone's home and you show that humility, you take your shoes off, you're respecting them and their space, and you recognize that you're a guest in their home, that goes a long way um, to them to, to respect you and, and go towards that initial, you know, buy-in or, or therapeutic alliance. Um, and then going from there, you know, just all the stuff we talk about, listening, let them know that they're heard, looking at them, you know, directly into their eyes and not just over at your, you know, laptop or iPad, making sure you're documenting everything. All those things that we talk a lot about here are super important to help establish credibility to get buy-in and to get that therapeutic alliance to have the freedom and the ability to do things that they may not be you know, necessarily comfortable with. So establish credibility uh, is the first one. There's a lot of, lots of ways to do that, but I feel like we need to be thinking about that. The second thing is to create quick change. So you know, here in the, the PT on ice world, we talk a lot about asterisk signs. Um, so what is that you know, asterisk sign with that patient? So let's say you know, they, can, they come in with shoulder pain um, you know, they're flexing their shoulder, ow, that hurts, I only go to, you know, 100 degrees, and then you do your magic, whatever your magic is, and then, you know, they lift it up to 140, and their pain went down by like three or four points, and at that moment, you are awesome. They <laughs> really start to believe, like, wow, this guy's good, or girl, um, they know what they're doing, and that, that, I mean, I can't overstate the value of that uh, in that first interaction, but when... When in the older adult patient, pain may not be present. You know, home health, that's, you know, typically the case. Skilled nursing facilities, acute care, um, you know, maybe an outpatient in some instances, but pain isn't always a big issue why people are coming to see physical therapy. It could be just they're not able to get up off the toilet. They can't get out of bed. They, they're having to walk with the cane now. Um, it's more related to function and, and just their capacity. But if that is the case, if pain is not present, that does not mean that you need to ignore their asterisk signs. They may be more functional asterisk signs that may not be related to pain. Um, so we can still test and retest to show quick change and establish our credibility um, and, and get that buy-in or get that early W. So a, common, a very common example um, that we can talk about is a sit-to-stand. So getting up from a chair, whatever that chair may be, um, a lot of people can have difficulty with that, especially uh, being able to come up to standing from varied, you know, different types of chairs. And so what can you, I just want you to think, what can you do right now to impact that person so they can now stand up out of the chair as before they came and saw you, they weren't able to do that. So think about all the factors that are involved with that. We got positional uh, modifications that we can make, you know, where are they sitting on the chair, you know, in terms of are they, you know, tilted forward a little bit or back? Where are their arms when they're going to stand up? Um, are they utilizing momentum at all? Are they rocking forward? Um, just some of those different me mechanics that we can easily, quickly change to get that early W. 
Um, what about support modifications? Can you raise the seat height? Um, that's a that's a pretty simple one to do. Throw it, you know, a pillow underneath their cushion. They can pop up, and you are then the best therapist they've ever had just from that quick uh, change and in, in interaction. Um, technique, you know, are they bracing? Are they, you know, trying to actually brace to increase their, you know, power production to be able to come up out of the chair? So some of these things that um, I know we may think is, you know, we may take for granted or think it's, you know, common sense. But we have an opportunity to do that with a lot of our patients to create quick change to get that, that early W. And I'll, I'll mention kind of a, a common one that, that I see is with uh, assistive devices. So someone walks in the clinic or I'm going into their home, don't ever assume that their assistive device is correctly adjusted. Uh, I mean, if you've been working long enough in PT, you'll see all kinds of crazy stuff with people you know, their handles are all the way up to their chest and they're bent over, you know, it's down to their knees. And I mean, it, it, it's pretty crazy to see how people get around with some of these walkers or canes. Um, but in particular, the standard walker, this is a quick tip. I'll, I'll give it to you for free, but standard walker. All right. So when you get a standard or a rolling walker, two wheels in the front, the wheels are on the outside typically. Um, and so what that does, it creates about an inch and a half um, on either side to where it's a little wider than the frame. Now, for most people, it's not a big issue, but for a lot of people that are dependent on a walker, a lot of them may live in older homes that have more narrow doorways. So bathroom is a very common one. So they get up to the bathroom, and what they have to do, they can't go straight into the doorway. They have to turn and do their little you know, side shuffle in and you know, almost lose their balance and fall, but they've been doing it for years. Um, that's all they've known. Well, what you can do as a therapist, you can take those walkers that are on the outside and you can take them off and switch them so the wheels are on the inside of the frame. Now that narrows the base of support by about you know three inches. Most of the time, that's not a big deal at all. You can test and retest that to see if that actually changed their walking ability. Excuse me. But often it doesn't. But what that three inches can allow them to walk straight into their bathroom and then you are the best therapist they've ever had just for making that simple adjustment. So all that, all that to say, all that rambling, um, I, I just want you to think, how can you make a quick change with your patients even if they don't have pain? We have a great capacity to do that. Some of us are in the home with the patient, which you know, we have a very unique opportunity to be able to see you know, what they're struggling with, um, how we can use furniture, how we can you know, move rugs, you know, we have this, a lot of options to work with. You know, if you're an outpatient, it may not be that simple, but I don't want you to miss out on that quick change, that buy-in, building that therapeutic alliance and getting that early W that's going to allow you to recommend some things that they may not be comfortable with, like doing barbell deadlifts or back squats or farmer carries or some of these other things that we'll talk about um, on the Older Adult Wednesday podcast. So, that's all I have for now. Uh, thank you all for listening. Allie, Shveta, good morning. Um, if you have any questions or any things that you have used to get that early W, it'd be great to have kind of a dialogue on this Facebook post. So for the podcast listeners, go uh, to the Institute of Clinical Excellence on Facebook. Um, look for this post. Look for the ugly, you know, shaved head, bearded guy, um, and you'll see, you know, hopefully some comments of some good, you know, tips and tricks that you all use uh, to get that early W. So y'all have a lovely Wednesday and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks.